Hi, I'm Pilgrim Beard of Device Pilot, and with me here today, I'm delighted to welcome Andrew Bissell, CEO and founder of SunEmp. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks very much. Hi, nice, nice to be here. So, would you like to start by just sort of introducing SunEmp? Uh, you know, what is it, and what what led you to start it? Sure. Um, so, put 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 most simplistically, we make a very compact thermal energy storage product, which can replace a number of things. The simplest thing that it can replace is a hot water tank. The sort of hot water tank that you might connect to a gas boiler or preferably to a heat pump or maybe heat electrically off the grid. Um, you can use the same kind of thermal storage as well for other uses. You can use it to provide space heating, central heating in a house or process heat in a factory. Um, and we can make these devices at multiple different scales. And in future, using um, a slight modification to the materials that we put into the device, uh, we'll be able to provide, uh, we can actually technically provide it today, we can provide cooling applications uh, down as low as minus 30 degrees C today. Um, so that supports things like frozen food, uh, refrigeration, cooling, you know, air conditioning, comfort cooling, and so on. And that may be increasingly important as, as the world warms uh, or heats as we've seen recently. Um, what differentiates what we do is that the products are very small. They're very physically compact. It's a bit like the shift from you know, lead acid to lithium ion in terms of the, of the energy density improvement, but obviously not in the electrical space, in the thermal space. Um, and I think the other part of your question was what, you know, a little bit about how did it start? Mm, yeah. you know, what, what, what was the motivator? Um, I'd, I'd exited a previous, so like like you, I'm a serial technology entrepreneur, you know, and uh, I'd exited a previous business with uh, my co-founder, um, Susan Lyon Bissell. Um, we, we, we're, we're both married and we start businesses together, which, and grow them, which for some people works really well for us and for other people might not, but it works great for us. And, and we've been running a software business in the medical imaging space. Um, and that exited very nicely and continued to grow, you know, here in the Edinburgh area, uh, but as part now of a multinational. Um, and kind of, you know, we were thinking about, do we do it again or do we, do we stop? We definitely didn't want to do medical imaging again, not because there's anything wrong with it. It's a great, great place to have impact. Um, but, you know, you don't want to do the same business again. You know, yeah. for, for me, that's, that's not ethical and, and it's not interesting. You know, and yeah. I think those two things are important. But for us, ethical business is really important. Yeah, so it has to have some impact on a major global problem, you know, whether that's improving cancer diagnostics and, and, and treatment, you know, for, for, you know, for aortic aneurysms or something, or, you know, fix climate change. So, you know, okay, we're not going to fix climate change on our own, but we could see a really big problem in the heart of climate change policy, if you like, and practice, which is, if, as is true, electricity is only something less than 20% of world final energy demand and heat is something significantly over 40%, it's about two and a half times more than the electricity demand. And yet everybody's focused on electricity when it comes to both generation and storage. And if you believe that storage is going to be vital to linking variable renewable energy to the times of use that people want to use it, the people and processes want to use it, you, you immediately arrive at the conclusion that you need massive amounts of thermal storage. Hmm. And, and you then arrive at the worry that but all that thermal storage is basically the same as what was designed by the Romans or people in prehistory. You know, it's, it's hot water in, in, in tanks. It's hot rocks or hot bricks. Um, you know, Romans would have would identified every single one of those technologies perfectly happily and gone, yep, we've got that, we've got that, we've got that. Um, so you're, you're sort of left, and the Romans did one other thing, which was ice houses, and that kind of gives you the lead in to, you know, oh, okay, may, maybe there is a way, because an ice house uses the, the, the change from solid to liquid of, of water, from ice to, to water, and, and in that actually stores a lot of, thermal energy, cold energy. And that gives you the hint as to what to do next. Um, and that's to use this, this latent or hidden heat 
that is in the the, the change of, of phase, the change from, from solid to liquid. Um, problem is ice is always at one temperature, basically. You know, it's going to be zero degrees C or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and, and that's it. Um, what you want is lots of ices that change phase at lots of different temperatures and a way to harness that. And, you know, what, what really kind of you know, the micro inspiration, of course, is often where you live. You know, we, we were living in a, in a Victorian terraced house on Edinburgh's seafront, um, you know, one of the best kept secrets. Edinburgh has a fantastic beachfront uh, and, you know, 100 square meter house, roughly no storage space because the Victorians never built built in wardrobes um, and, you know, a gas combi boiler on the wall. And that fits nicely with the with the dimensions of the house. And you're thinking, well, how would I put, you know, thousand liter hot water tank in here if I wanted to use a heat pump that was time shifted from, you know, when the wind was blowing in the grid or when solar PV was active on my roof or maybe solar thermal in some way. And, you know, I want to bridge multiple days because I might have sunny days and not so sunny days, windy days and not so windy days. And, and you know, you immediately go, well, I can't fit. I can't even fit a 200 litre tank in this house, mm. let alone a you know, thousand plus litre tank. So I need something much more compact. So that was kind of the micro inspiration. You know, was was what do I need to drive my personal energy transition? So you were coming very much from sort of first principles needs and, and with from a somewhat personal perspective, um, uh, rather than stumbling across phase change science and thinking, what can I do with that? No, no, it was very, it was very directed search. You know, it was, it was. We, we've, we, we now know we've got a problem to solve. Let's evaluate every single possible storage technology. Yeah, but you know, um, and then if with with what with one that we think we can bring to market. Yeah, I mean, water is actually quite a remarkable substance and has quite a high specific heat capacity anyway, doesn't it? So, um, I mean, how how does your technology compare to water? Just just roughly, I mean, how much more heat per unit volume or weight or, or whatever can you store? So it's storing it actually about the same amount, but it's storing it at a different temperature. So the, the, the key material that we use today in most of our products is a material that we call plentigrade P58. Okay, so the P means plus, and 58 means 58 Celsius, very mm -hmm. simple naming scheme. Um, and that, instead of, unlike water, which changes phase at zero degree C, it changes phase at 58. And actually, it has roughly the same specific heat capacity as water. And it has roughly the same latent heat capacity as water. And that is quite remarkable because almost all the other phase change materials are significantly lower than that. So water is very special, as you say. You know, it's, that, it's all that hydrogen bonding, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it has really a, a very, very high both specific and latent heat capacity. To get that in a phase change material, another temperature, that, that takes a lot of skill. And, we, and that didn't all come from inside the company. We, we started working with the University of Edinburgh School of Chemistry. Uh, we, 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 again, we did a very broad search to find partners and ended up finding them you know, on our doorstep, um, which was very gratifying, um, very helpful. Uh, and we formed a, you know, a fantastic um, partnership there. Um, that first material was developed within you know, the first sort of five years of the company's life um, and has stood us in tremendous stead. Um, David Oliver, who, who did the PhD that, you know, in, under which it was developed, joined the company and became our head of materials. Um, and subsequently, that team has brought forward, I think, you know, probably, I don't know, hundreds of potential materials from which we've selected a palette of the really reliable, performant, um, you know, good um, in, in the sense of you know, no, non-toxicity, non-flammability and so on. We've brought forward a palette of maybe you know, 30 materials that we, can, that we can populate our devices with. So it's a bit like, I suppose we're a bit like a company that's got a battery technology, but instead of having one chemistry, we have about 30 chemistries. Mm. And they all work and they all work really reliably. So, you know, 10,000 cycles would be our minimum, our minimum expectation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, and that's 
you know. Climability is an interesting one. It hadn't even occurred to me. I do remember looking around the building research establishment in uh, Watford a while ago, and they uh, they had this wonderful demo where you, um, it was a hot day, and there were some wimpy homes that had been built on site, right. and um, some of the rooms were beautifully cool without aircon. And I was like, wow, what's what's this all about? And they had phase change wax panels um, yes. on the plasterboard. And I was yeah. like, this is amazing. Why doesn't everyone have that? Uh, and the person who showed me around said, because it's highly flammable. I was like, okay, maybe not. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, that's an aspect. It, it, I it's interesting that. because what, what you've just highlighted is that if you like the competing phase change technology generally is some kind of wax, mm. right? It might be paraffin derived. It might be... Mm bio bio derived which yeah. often things like palm oil which is not not always a good thing um and and you know those are half the energy density but they're also extremely flammable so the work road we've gone which which uses salts mm. salts salt water solutions salt hydrates um that's really hard it turns out it's really hard to stabilize the materials that the, the normally you'd expect them to last for 10 cycles so the, the the real art in what we've done, science in what we've done, is about stabilizing these materials so they they can cycle, you know, happily ten thousand times with you know with with no no discernible degradation of capacity. So when I asked about comparisons with water, and you said, well, quite similar, but ice at a different temperature. I mean, it, compared to just storing heat in water at fifty eight degrees, it's it's significantly better though, presumably because of the phase change. So so yeah. Water, Water, as you go up in temperature, goes up in energy, right? Kind of pretty much linearly because you're using the specific heat capacity. If you're in the range, say, you know, 30 degrees to 80 degrees or something like that, it's just a nice you know, linear ramp. Our material follows the same linear ramp until it gets to 58 and then does that. It just goes up in energy without changing temperature. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it's finished changing phase you know we've reached we've reached the the full melting of the material and then it keeps going up in temperature and and therefore in energy but it's already jumped up you know enormously from that initial curve so over a useful temperature range let's say you know a useful temperature range for hot water is 40 degrees at the bottom because below 40 it kind of it doesn't feel yep. warm to maybe you know, 75 at the top would probably be the maximum temperature at which you'd want to store, whether it was a water tank or, or a phase change material heat battery. Over that kind of range, you know, we have something like a three to four fold energy density advantage. Wow. If, if you restricted yourself arbitrarily to, let's say, a plus or minus five degrees around that 58, we'd be 10 times better. Right. But actually, yeah. you're not going to do that in reality. I mean, yeah. Although you might do that for a cooling application. So, you know, just, just to be clear, you know, water at zero is a good, a good thing. Ice bank, yeah, and that, and that exhibits the same, the same properties. Mm -hmm. But zero may be a bit cold for some applications. If you want to cool a building, you don't need to go as low as zero. And going to zero involves more energy usage in the chiller mm -hmm plant that is going to freeze that material if yeah. you chose instead to use 10 degrees celsius as your phase change point you'd get a more efficient system so we in fact have a range that we're developing that will in fact some are deployed that address that kind of you know 5 to 15 degree c interval in which you'd want to store and there you might be in quite a narrow range because actually for for cooling you a narrow range tends to be what you end up using. And there, the energy density advantage could be up to 10, mm, up to 10 full. So you mentioned, you mentioned heat pumps, and there's increasing interest in heat pumps for obvious reasons. I mean, yeah. a bit like your phase change thing, they seem to have this almost sort of magic property that you can almost get more out than you put in in, in some strange way. So um, uh, so if, if you just took electrical energy, maybe spare solar or, or off-peak electricity or whatever, yeah and you use it to change the phase in your material that's one way of doing it and you've shifted that use but you only you've only shifted one times as the use as it were right um i mean presumably it is quite close to one times as well because i'd imagine there's not a huge amount of losses i mean there'll be some heat leakage but but apart from that um you know, it's probably it's fairly it, efficient it, is it yeah i mean we we made some particularly um difficult to swallow choices at the beginning 
right? Which where we said, we're going to absorb a massive amount of extra cost and we're going to vacuum insulate the, the, the product. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to work really, really hard to get the cost out. And that's the path we've gone down. We, we chose to be very, very low, low heat loss. That wasn't intrinsic to the phase change. That was intrinsic to design choices at the device level. Um, and that's been the right choice. So, you know, when, when used as a thermal store, you know, with backup electric heating, um, it's an A-plus rated device on the European energy label. Um, you know, what so does, what does that mean? <laughs> Can you turn it mean? into percentages so it, over time? Let, or something? Let, me, let, me, let me give you, give you sort of a, a, a threefold example. Let's compare an old hot water tank, right, which is in somebody's house today with a, you know, one of those ones with a sort of little thin layer of green foam on it or, or a, you know, one of those red puffer jackets, mm -hmm. right? That's probably leaking somewhere between three and four kilowatt hours per day of heat. Okay, yep. probably only stores twelve. Okay, so it's it's losing thirty or forty percent of its capacity every day, and yep. that has to be replaced. Compare it with a modern, you know, really good quality hot water tank that you'd buy today that's B rated. Um, it would be leaking one point three to one point five kilowatt hours per day. So it's roughly twice as good as that older model. Mm. We're twice as good again. We're 0 0.75 kilowatt hours for the same equivalent 200 liter capacity device, if that makes sense. Yeah. We, we, obviously, we're not 200 liters. We, we're only close to 50 liters of, 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 of internal stored material, but we deliver the equivalent of a 200 liter yeah. hot water tank. As okay. an example. So that's, that's clear. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, but obviously, if you use the heat pump to charge um, your thermal battery, then yeah. you get the, the multiplying effect of the heat pump, and that's obviously nice. But yeah. heat pumps themselves have some criteria in terms of um, you know, the temperatures they like to work at and so on. And right. it seems there's been a lot of progress over the last few years about improving the, the temperature that heat pumps can, can right. deliver at, which presumably might help with, with getting to these sort of magic 58 degrees C type things with, with good efficiency. So, so I mean, is is your technology a natural sort of fit for for heat pumps? And maybe we could kind of answer that in two parts. One is the the plumbing part, as it were. So, do systems make sense and and, and everything yeah. works happily together? And then the other yeah. part, I suppose, would be the the control aspect. That, you yeah. know, do heat pumps understand external storage, or do heating systems understand the combination of heat pumps plus uh, thermal storage, uh, and and you know, so they can be managed so that you can either pump heat or take heat out of your thermal battery according to uh, the time of day or the price of electricity or, or, or yeah. whatever. Okay, lot, lot, lots to unpack there. Let, let's, let's start with you know, the, the evolution of the heat pump market. Um, so you're absolutely right that, you know, if, if I go back about 10 years when we first wanted to use a heat, a heat pump to melt the material in a heat battery, in other words, to charge it, um, it was really hard to find one that would reliably deliver a temperature above 58 degrees C. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, you know, in reality, we need to have the return to the heat pump be above 58. And they tend to have a delta T of about seven, you know, when they're running. So in reality, that means a 65 degree C reliable heat pump. Because you need to melt all your salt. You need to melt it all. Exactly. Yeah. To, get, yeah. to get full storage. So, yeah. you know, when, when we looked at that in those days, the only models that could do that were were two stage. In other words, they had they had a you know one one compressor running some refrigerant like R four ten A that lifted from ambient temperature could be as low as minus twenty to a mid temperature like thirty, and then the second one running R one three four A another another um, uh, refrigerant that would lift from thirty to as high as eighty actually because you know you could get you can get fifty degree lift on each stage and. You know, they're, they're beasts. They're wonderful heat pumps. Um, they also have, you know, so you know, they have a lot of refrigerant that has high global warming potential that you don't really ideally want to use that. And they're quite expensive, mm -hmm. but we could we could make it work. Yeah. In, in recent times, we've seen an evolution towards lower GWP, lower global warming potential refrigerant. So we're moving away from HFCs towards things like other materials, let's say, of which, you know, the, the, the acme of what people are now using, I'm not saying the acme of perfection, but it's pretty close, is people are using propane. Mm. Uh, they're using a few hundred grams of propane 
uh, in and propane has a global warming potential of three. Okay, so it's it's only if you release those 150 grams or whatever it is of, of propane, 150 is a, a typical limit. You're actually releasing the equivalent of half a kilo of CO2. Which I mean, what is that in, in days of it, gas boiler use? I it's, don't know. <laughs> it's it's like it's like a you know, it's it's a few minutes of your gas boiler running. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, over over the lifetime, it's if 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 your propane heat pump, your R290 heat pump loses all of its charge, mm -hmm. um, it's the equivalent of a hundred thousand times less carbon emissions than your boiler will generate through its life. Orders of magnitude. Roughly. I like. I like okay. it. Excellent. Yeah. So it's, it's you know it's ten orders. Of, it's five orders of magnitude. Sorry, less than than, than running a gas boiler. So okay. you know, good good in that box. Good in the safety box because the IEC you know have tightly regulated this and you know, everybody's happy with the safety case. Um, and so you've got vendors you know coming onto the market more and more and more with R two ninety heat pumps. And the other good thing about an R two ninety heat pumps, it will make seventy degrees C all day, right? Cold weather, warm weather, doesn't really care. It'll just do 70. Um, now, it won't, you know, doing 50 would give you a higher coefficient of performance, a bit more efficiency, but it will do 70. And why is 70 important? 70 is important because at 70, every radiator system is already ready for it, right? You know, might be able to run a lower temperature. You should weather compensate. So, you know, in, in, in the warmer times, you run at lower temperatures because the radiators have sufficient capacity you know, to emit the amount of heat required from a lower temperature. At other times of the year, midwinter, for example, you might need to run closer to 70. But it also means you can melt heat batteries. And now you can open up things that are relatively interesting. So one is, very simple one, but it's really important, is you can replace the hot water tank you'd otherwise need for the, for the heat pump. I go back to my to my case, you know, more than a decade ago, living in that Victorian house by the sea in Edinburgh. I didn't have room to, to, to put a hot water tank, but I would have had room to put a small heat battery. And I could have easily had a heat pump outside my house. Mm -hmm. So it was it's an enabler to remove combi boilers and replace with heat pumps in places where, and those are many, where there's no room for a hot water tank. Yeah, because I think or, unfortunately over the last 20 years, Britain's been removing its hot water tanks, which is uh, replacing absolutely. with combi boilers. Yeah, absolutely. So new builds typically never have the room for, a, for, a, for anything other than a combi. So anything that was built in the last 30, 40 years probably doesn't have the room. Mm -hmm. And as you say, most people have repurposed spaces mm. uh, that they freed up. So you know, we know from, from massive projects with housing associations, you know, for example, decarbonizing so far, I think about 30 or 40 tower blocks, high rise buildings, you know, with thousands of apartments where we've put a little heat battery in every apartment, along with a Kenza heat pump, another company you might want to uh, want to talk to in due course, mm. um, if you haven't already interviewed them, um, you know, that, that combination on a, on a, shared ambient loop so essentially it's pulling heat from the ground so geothermal loop going to every apartment allows every apartment to have the equivalent of a gas boiler a gas combi boiler that's been taken out but actually it's a heat pump running with coefficient performance probably about averaging two and a half to three well, presumably in that case i mean it, generally it's more efficient to have big things than lots of small things so if you're designing that thing from scratch you might have one big heat pump um, not necessarily no because district heating, at least in its UK implementations, often leaks a lot of heat. Because it's hard to insulate the pipes. Because it's hard yep. to insulate the pipes. I, I mean, you can do it, but your, 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 what the Germans would call technique <laughs> has to be really good. Yeah. Your, your, your practice has to be really good. And, and while there are companies in the UK and installers in the UK that can really do this, there's many that can't. And a lot of district heating has been installed in ways that, you know, they were projected to be 90% efficient and they're actually 40% efficient. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, the, the corridors and stairwells are really well heated yeah. in those buildings. And that, and, that, and that isn't good. If instead you bring the ambient loop around the building, you're bringing heat from the ground at five degrees or 10 degrees around the building, there's no heat loss problem. You know, so so it's interesting that, that the trade-offs are in the direction of today in the UK for sure, 
um, lots of small things actually make a lot of sense. Interesting. And, and it's easy from ret retrofit because it's like for like. Okay, yeah. so we've, so, okay, you've convinced me on the thermodynamics. Um, let, let's talk about sort of coordination and, and smarts as it, as, as it were. Yeah. So, so let, we've got, we've got your heat battery, we've got a, um, a heat pump, we might have, um, we'll have some kind of heating controls, um, and we might have other things as well, uh, like smart meters and PV and other things which kind of mm -hmm. have, may have some implication over what you want to do at any moment in time. Yeah. Um, how what what kind of instrumentation out and control in does does a sunamp uh, battery provide and um how you know yeah how does that interact sort of who's in control typically yeah it's a, it's a really interesting question because there's always a temptation when you develop a new device to want to be the system controller and and actually it's a temptation we 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 basically resisted we said we need to appear to the ecosystem of devices in which we work to be a hot water cylinder, right? Yeah. So we, 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 we jump through some hoops internally within our controller. So there's a, you know, there, there is, of course, a controller on board and the controller has some temperature sensors and various other things with which it measures things about the heat battery. But then externally, it looks like a hot water tank. So if, if it's talking to a gas boiler, it's, it's opening and closing a volt-free contact in order to tell the gas boiler, you know, to, to either run or not run. It's kind mm. of simple. Uh, it, it's arguably, you know, for some people, very frustrating. The people who love, who love IoT, who love, you know, who want to know the state of charge, who, you know, who, who want all of that, they get frustrated with us because in a sense we go, yeah, but the 99% mainstream actually want it to look like a, like a, like a, like a hot water tank. Yeah. And we do the same towards heat pumps, you know, so heat pumps typically have a, a sensor that, that is their own sensor they put into a pocket on the product. And today we simulate that. So we, we switch between resistances. So that sensor, of course, is an you know, NTC or something, you know, uh, resistance based sensor. And we just basically switch between two resistances, one that says, I'm at 40 degrees, charge me. And one that says, I'm at 75 degrees, I'm full. Okay. And, and, and it's and it's 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 stupidly dolly dimple stuff, mm. you know. But where it gets us to is we're in the market, fulfilling customer needs today. W where do we want to go? So you know, actually, you know, we have RS two three two and we have RS four eight five and we can run Modbus and it's all on the controller. Um, and so gradually, as we engage more and more with with the ecosystem around us we start to enable those interfaces. So, you know, at some point soon, I think, um, without revealing anything, one or more heat pump manufacturers will, will have an integration where they talk to us digitally ra 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 rather than, you know, in, in our kind of simulated way. Sure. And, and, and that will be a nice day because it means that, you know, we, we'll, we'll, I mean, from multiple perspectives, we'll improve the integration. Mm -hmm. But it works perfectly well just now. So, and so you, a Sunamp um, yeah. knows how charged it is, does it? In 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 a, with a certain level of granularity. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we we could put on a you know a tremendously high granularity metering system and know it pretty much perfectly, but we don't need to. You no. know, we 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 need to know kind of like you know ten steps or something. Yeah. No, no, sure. And and yeah. that and that's good enough for for those other uses. Then you go up another level where you go, now I want to be part of demand side response. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 want, I want to be able to be part of that ecosystem. One way is to say, well, the heat pump's going to know and it will just charge me, you know, when, when the signal arrives. And, that, and that's perfectly acceptable. The other way is for us to know and ask the heat pump to charge us. And so, you know, in various trials with, you know, with, with the multiplicity of um, energy providers and utilities in different parts of the world we are in different kinds of trials where we are running and some horizon 2020 projects and so on where we're running you know demand side response um and and we we, we can be you know a demand side response agent directly as in we can be resistance heated we can be a demand side response by asking something else mm -hmm. to run yep. like the heat pump um and and those are you know in our medium term future things we're going to do but you know we, we've, we've also tr trodden very very carefully 
because we do not want to be that device which you know allows security risks in the physical infrastructure of the country you know if a million or 10 million heat batteries are deployed yeah they become an interesting target and, and, and we, we, we don't want to be insecure so we'd be, yeah. we'd be more cautious maybe than some people would have liked you know that the people that would have just gone ah put a raspberry pi in it and make it go you know well maybe you know but maybe not um one other thing you talked about pv so for pv we we work with people who provide and, and an example would be uh, my energy who provide a device called eddy um, which goes in an ecosystem with their zappy and the zappy charges cars um, and and knows about the pv on your roof so you know when when, when the pv on your roof has plenty of power more than you can use and you're about to export to the grid the the my energy ecosystem would either divert to charge your electric car or divert energy to to charge up a hot water tank through its immersion heater or a heat battery um and they've been great great partners um we've worked well with them again company i'm sure that you will either have interviewed or want to interview uh, for your series um i, I own their products even better than that <laughs> even better excellent yes. Yeah. You're, you're already ready for the heat battery then. Uh, we need to get you one. Um, and, you know, that 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 is a you know, very nice integration. Again, I think demand response will come on that platform before too long as well. It's another way of achieving the goal. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is we're kind of non-religious about this. Um, you know, we, we're non-dogmatic, but we are dogmatic about one thing. You know, we, we want the device to work even if the internet goes down. Right. So all our devices always work first and foremost to deliver the services that you expect in your house, mm -hmm. the hot water that you want um, in future, the space heating that you want, even if everything goes, you know, goes down in terms of Internet connectivity. That is so important. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the second bit of dogma is we don't want to build a big security risk somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're just cautiously edging our way into devices that talk to other devices yeah well thanks for that i mean that's not only a very interesting answer but also interesting insight into the strategic thinking behind you know why you've done what you've done which uh, which makes a lot of sense um you've been very generous with your time andrew i just wanted to kind of finish off really by asking you uh well it should be interesting to know kind of what scale you're at today in terms of the number of units and, and what your plans are um and, yeah. and your sort of goals over the next few years and any any obstacles you see to achieving those and and kind of related to that perhaps um you know if you could wave a magic wand is there any kind of government policy you'd like to see uh which would accelerate that um yeah so um we, we're we're about just short of twenty thousand heat batteries delivered to the world mm -hmm. um at this point somewhere in that in that ballpark um delivering order of magnitude 500 to 1,000 a month now. So, so, so things are accelerating quite fast. Um, with a round of finance coming up that will help us accelerate dramatically more. Uh, and we would expect that probably by sometime around, you know, latter part of this decade, 27 or something like that um, we might be doing a million devices a year uh, across you know essentially all the all the critical economies of the world you know I, I expect the current plan says you know we'll have a big factory in in the UK uh, we'll have a big factory in the US and we'll have a big factory somewhere in Asia um, churning out you know 300,000 heat batteries a year we, we, we will not be selling all of those under our brand. We already have OEM partnerships. Um, we will have more OEM partnerships. Uh, and you know, some of it will be under our brand um, and some of it will be, will be delivered with partners. Um, and that is just a drop in the bucket because there's over 40 million, between 40 and 50 million hot water tanks sold every year globally. And for us, those are just drop-in replacements you know, with a better product. Yeah. Um, and then there's lots of other opportunities around heating and cooling that you know we haven't had time to go into today, but um, maybe we will in future. Um, magic wand, uh, uh, decouple 
the price setting mechanism in electricity so that gas is not the determining factor of the electricity price in a grid where more and more of the energy is renewable. Um, fix that one urgently, preferably before this winter. Mm. That that's actually yeah, and that and in, in a way that's not really self-centered towards Sunamp. That's just about having the right policies. Yeah. Um, if I wanted to kind of look for something a little bit more centered to what we can offer, I'd say, and then add an overlay of giving people a very easy way to be good demand response participants in multiple different dimensions and get paid for it mm -hmm. easily. In the same way that it's as easy, you know, as buying your electricity, you know, you, you you can you can easily sign up to an offer from somebody. It's independent of your electricity supplier, and you can offer your devices, whatever they are, electric batteries, vehicles, I mean, electric vehicles, um, or or heat batteries or hot water tanks, to that demand response pool, and get paid for it. Lovely. Simple. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's a great note note to end on. Let's hope uh, let's hope that someone in government is listening. <laughs> but thank so. you, thank you so much for your time, Andrew. Yeah. It's been a fascinating oh. tour of the sort of science and technology of, of heat stores and and what the future holds, which is very exciting. And you've been very generous with your your knowledge and insight. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Appreciate it.